Hello and welcome to today's WinAD Google Hangout. My name is Kevin Barefoot with Winthrop Intelligence. Uh, we have a really neat uh, and unique panel today comprised of Division I athletes from around the country to discuss their experiences while participating in college athletics and also share some of their views on a variety of topics uh, from recruiting uh, to balancing the demands of college athletics to even full cost of attendance. But let's start by introducing our panel today uh, and, and share with us who we have. Colleen, we'll start with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen Follin. I'm from Downingtown, Pennsylvania. I'm a goalkeeper on the Loyola University Maryland women's soccer team. Hi, I'm Houston Summers. I am a rising senior from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I'm on the men's track and field team uh, here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hi, my name is Malcolm Brogdon. I am a rising fifth year at the University of Virginia I'm on the men's basketball team. And I am Marin Cracker. I'm from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and I am a red shirt junior from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So first off, I want to thank all of you for participating today and taking time out of your busy schedules. I also want to take a moment to thank the athletic directors at each of the institutions represented today for putting us in touch with uh, some of the best and brightest that their programs offer. So I appreciate you all joining us today. You know, I want to give a 30-second background on why we're doing this panel. Uh, in January of this year, I had the opportunity to see Condoleezza Rice speak at the FBS Leadership Summit. Uh, in Dallas around the college football playoff. And a sidebar is if you ever have the opportunity to see Condoleezza Rice speak, you need to do it. Uh, she was unbelievable. But one of the members of the audience uh, that day, Craig Littlepage, athletic director at UVA, stood up and asked Condi a question. Uh, and, and the question was, how do we do a better job as athletic leaders of, of telling our story, of sharing all of the positive things that are taking place in college athletics. And Condoleezza gave this great answer. She told this backstory, But the moral of her story was that sometimes you don't need to change the message. You need to change the messenger. And that's what we're doing today. We're changing the messenger and giving uh, student athletes the opportunity uh, to share their positive experiences and really highlight some of the uh, the virtues of college athletics and also participating in college athletics. So let's get right into the questions. We have a lot of, uh, of questions, a lot of ground to cover to, to our panel, uh, you know, so we can get through as many questions as possible. It may be that we, you know, don't have all four of you answer each of the questions, uh, but we'll definitely get to all of you. And then as we discussed earlier, you know, if you have a thought or, or you want to, uh, to weigh in on something, certainly feel free to jump right in. The first question we'll start with, and, and Colleen, we'll just start with you here. Talk about how college athletics participation has prepared you to be a leader off the field once you graduate. How have you evolved uh, in being a student athlete over the last few years? Um, well, Kevin, uh, I've gained so much confidence and uh, from being a student athlete. In terms of leadership, I've not only been able to be put into a team environment from an early age and from being a college athlete, but I've been given opportunities to lead my teammates, make important decisions, especially in the heat of the moment, to kind of trust my instincts a little bit more. And also, just uh, kind of off the field as well, I've been given leadership opportunities through my student athlete advisory committee, uh, through different facets in the Loyola school community that I don't think I would have had had I not been a student athlete. Houston, Houston, how about you, man? Talk about the evolution of, of your leadership capabilities from, from your playing days. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to dive into my history a little, a little later in the uh, broadcast if we can, but you know, just to speak to one specific opportunity that we have here at UNC, um, <clears throat> our athletic director before Bubba Cunningham uh, was Dick Bedour, and he began a leadership academy that is called um, the Bedour Carolina Leadership Academy, and it provides really substantive ways in which um, we can get feedback from our teammates, and, and it's all anonymous, but we can actually have really interesting examples of areas that we're really strong and that we lead well, and areas in that, that we don't lead so well. So. I think for me, that's been probably the most substantive and impactful um, tool that we've been given here at Carolina to evaluate our leadership potential and our abilities and our weaknesses and continue to move forward from there. Malcolm, how about you, man? You know, related to you know, 
just being part of the program and being around you know your coaches and leaders how, how has that prepared you especially as a fifth year senior because you're close to to be into the end of the collegiate road how, how have you evolved and, and and how has that uh, prepared you to be a leader off the court you know I, I I think it's given me so many tools for the real world um, one of which is is you know being able to um, interact with others in a positive way I mean as a as a guy that grows from being a freshman to one of the older guys, one of the veterans on a team, you learn how to deal with different types of people. You learn how to, um, you know, adapt to your environment and the people around you. And I think that's one of the ways that, you know, athletics has prepared me on the court and also off the court in the community. And when I when I choose to do community outreach and I'm put in the community, I'm a, I'm able to, you know, um, interact with others. Um, in ways that I wouldn't be able to if I wasn't a student athlete. And Marin, how about you? Well, I would say, like, specifically with our team, our team is a huge, huge, huge um, support from our alumni. So we still have alumni come in and play with us. We still have alumni coach us. Um, two of our assistant coaches were alumni, and they basically are the foundation of this program, and they pass it down to us. So I we have girls that are still playing with us from about eight years ago. And so they are just so, so, so invested in this program and it's passed on us and we're taught how to lead and we're taught how to lead on the court especially. And so we just pride, pride ourselves in a player-led program and they really do just a phenomenal job getting us ready to, ready to lead. Coaches aside, our alumni are just huge for us. So you, let's stick with you here, Marion, on this next question. You, you know, you talked about uh, the alumni and mm -hmm. past players. And so certainly, you know, one of the things that, that you get or gain from uh, taking part in athletics is an expanded network. You, you know, you right. know a lot more people. How, how, what's your perception of how athletics participation will help you in finding a job after college? You know, what type of doors do you think that athletics participation is open for you? Oh, I think that we have just a huge step forward upon graduating just with the connections that we've made. For me personally, uh, I would like to stay at the collegiate level and coach. Now, that isn't exactly an easy job, but for the connections we've made, it's I have two coaches that we went through that I can have those connections. There's a lot of alumni that are already at the collegiate level coaching. There's people that have recruited me along the way that have said, hey, listen, you want to get into coaching? We'll have a spot for you. Please contact me after you're done. And I just think that it, the whole saying of it's not who you, or what you know, it's who you know, I think it's so vital, especially for us athletes, because honestly, I, I can trust that I will have a job as long as I take care of what I need to take care of within my college career. I'll be able to reach out to someone who will be able to connect me with a job eventually. Colleen, I see you, I see you nodding your head over there. Talk, talk about you know, what your maybe plans are, if you, if you have any after school, and, and how athletics is, may help you in, that, in those endeavors. Yeah, sure. So I actually am a fifth year as well, like Malcolm, and in January I'll be pursuing a job at KPMG in Washington, D.C. as an accountant. But uh, I got that job mainly through my resume just jumping out with athletics. Uh, it's the first thing that pops out. It's the first thing that interviewers see on my resume. And it's kind of that icebreaker in a way of, oh, talk to me about your your balance of a rigorous academic schedule with a strong athletic schedule and kind of what leadership um, skills have you developed along the way, what is it like to be on a team and to have to deal with all the issues that come up or just kind of that camaraderie that comes with it. So I think in, in terms of that, it it really helped open doors for me to that icebreaker, that, that first initial kind of get the interview, get in the door, and then from there go and show that I'm capable of doing the job that they want me to do. And, and there's been studies that have demonstrated that, that, in fact, college athletes have a better chance than the general population of getting a job after college because of those things that you talked about. Malcolm, are you uh, uh, pursuing a playing career? Are you, are you, uh, you know, looking at KPMG or, you know, some type of uh, uh, career after basketball? What are you thinking uh, in the in the near future, and uh, and how has athletics helped prepare you there? Um, I am so I am looking to play basketball as long as I can um, after school and try to make money doing it. But after that, I hopefully want to start a nonprofit organization um, that focuses on sustainability, clean water, and poverty in um, impoverished communities like Africa and South America. Um, 
but as far as athletics, I think it's significantly aided me. I think I have a great advantage on, you know, students at my school and other schools solely on the fact that I have, you know, resources, I have connections that I've built purely through exposure, um, whether that's being on the court, whether that's people seeing your interviews after games. Um, people are always watching you when you're, when you're a student athlete in college. You're on a great stage all the time. And um, when they see your character, when they see that you're a person that is, that is kind and that is always trying to do the right thing, and then when you have the blessing of being good at your sport, people want to help you. People, people reach out to you. And, you know, I, just, I think being a student athlete in college has, has more, than it's more than just the money that um, pays for your scholarship. It's, it's about the connections that, you know, set you up and pay your, pay your ticket for the rest of your life. Houston, how about you, man? What, talk, talk about the, the, the post-college network you've developed and, and uh, what benefits you might have from, from participation. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll dive into the history a little bit now, and then you know we can we can keep going from there. But you know, coming coming to Carolina after playing seven years of professional baseball is um, you know quite an quite an interesting step. So I had a lot of contacts lined up, um, you know, coming into the into university, um, and and it built even more coming out. And I, I can expand upon that more well, later. And, but and let's let's not gloss over this. Let's let's take a minute here. Houston has a little bit different background than the other panelists. Houston, go 30 seconds here and tell us your background before you got to Carolina. Sure. Um, I, was, I went to high school in Greensboro, North Carolina at Northwest Guilford um, and was drafted out of high school um, at 17 years old. I was the youngest American-born player to be signed by the Arizona Diamondbacks at the time. Um, I was shipped off to Missoula, Montana at 17 and you know entered the professional world, which is a completely different world than college athletics. But... Um, learned, had to grow up really, really quickly, um, and ultimately spent three and a half years with the Arizona Diamondbacks, and then was sent over to the St. Louis Cardinals and played uh, about two and a half years with the St. Louis Cardinals, and spent a little bit of time at every level in the minor leagues um, before I was 20 years old, and um, spent some time in the big leagues working with uh, Tom Candiotti and, and you know other members in the Diamondbacks organization, uh, trying to get me ready for that next step, and. Um, they wanted to send me back to A ball, and I said thanks. I'm going to go back to school, and ultimately landed here at uh, Carolina. And so, you know, again, I didn't want to kind of just just pass that by because I think that lends itself, that experience lends itself to you having a really unique perspective, and that leads into my next question for for the panel here is, you know, that given the time commitment, uh, given the the physical requirements, the pressures. Uh, let's talk about some of the tangible benefits of being uh, being a student athlete. Malcolm, you, you alluded to the intangible benefits of the network and, and, and the fact that people want to help you, which are which are unbelievably huge. But Houston, let's start with you here. Uh, in the minor leagues, you're carrying your own bags and staying in bad <laughs> hotels and eating out of vending machines. Now fast yeah. forward to Carolina. Let's talk about the tangible benefits of your scholarship and what your perspective is on those. So I will say it does get better, and some organizations are better than others. So, um, but that that is very prevalent. It is um, it's a struggle at some point in times in the minor leagues, especially if you weren't one of those bonus babies. Um, but here at Carolina, we are so very well taken care of. It's 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 unbelievable. And a lot of my a lot of my buddies that I talked to that were here at Carolina and are now you know just drafted a couple of months ago. Um, I guess I should say last month. Um, they're in they're in shock right now. You know they're on buses that are overcrowded and they're sleeping on the floors and they're you know they're eight people to a four bedroom apartment and you know they get twenty dollars a day meal money. So it's 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 tough. It's a completely different world. And I think a lot of individuals miss the fact that, um, you know that we are so incredibly privileged and, and lucky to be at incredible institutions that really have um, you know the best interests of the athlete at heart at all times. Marin, what's your perception of some of the tangible benefits that, that you know the things that that are kind of measurable that, that you receive as as taking part in in athletics? Yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to say that our women's basketball team is very well taken care of at this university, um, much more so than a lot of the other athletic departments in within the Horizon League and even within our own athletic department. And we do a lot of uh, of the fundraising ourselves. We do 
we, I mean, I know each booster by name, by occupation, with their family, and that's just, we really, along with Mary Ellen and Adam Miller, and they just do a phenomenal job fundraising for us in order to have those tangible benefits that otherwise we would not have. And if you ask a lot of the other sports within our athletic department, they are not as fortunate as us. The, the soccer teams, they're, they're busing those 10 hours double seated. You know, they, they have, we're able, we're lucky enough to charter those. We're lucky enough to um, be able to eat out nice places on the road. If you ask the soccer team, they're going to Subway before games, you know, and um, that's, you know, that's good enough. But um, our women's basketball team is really taken care of, but we really, we put ourselves out there to get that, to uh, get the funding to be able to do those type of things. And um, we pride ourselves in working hard for what we get. We describe ourselves as a blue collar program. And um, that comes along with having to swallow your pride and asking those big boosters for money and to ask them to support our trips. We, um, due to our circumstances within our league, we have to go to those big tournaments in order to boost our RPI, in order to play those big teams that we can't come to play us. Um, so we have very, very, um, our tangible benefits are special for our school. For other schools, they might look at us and think, we might uh, be on the lower end of the financial uh, spectrum in college athletics, but we're, for we're very fortunate to have what we have. We work hard for what we have, but overall, um, our school, is we do well with what we have. <laughs> well, and, 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 and juxtapose that, though, to the general student population, because as you made the subway comment for women's soccer, I was thinking I, I would have crushed some, some subway in college. Right. You know, if, I was, if right. I was getting subway in, in my college days, uh, maybe juxtapose that to the general student population. I mean, that, talk about, talk about uh, you know, maybe the athletic department as a whole, uh, whether it be subway or nice restaurants relative to the general student population. You're, you're all getting some things, certainly, that, that others aren't. Oh, absolutely, and that, that goes without saying, and that also creates some animosity within any college that the athletes are given certain benefits that regular students are not given. Um, but the student athletes here, we, I mean, we're provided our scholarship, we're pro provided our books, um, we receive stipends for rent, for um, food off campus, for um, things like that, and those, those tangible books tangible benefits are huge. Those regular students who are not receiving that type of aid, um, it's, it's hard for them when they find out what we are receiving, but we, we like to look at it as it is our full-time job. We are being paid to perform for the university, to represent the university, the community, our families, and the students as well. So um, it's a double-edged sword. We are very thankful for what we get, but we are not, um, we are also very grateful for what we get. Absolutely, Malcolm. How about you, man? At a at a, at a high profile, uh, you know, large institution, revenue sport, men's basketball. You know, talk about some of the the tangible benefits that that you've received. Um, you know, at at UVA, um, I can't speak for the rest of the ACC, but at UVA specifically, they take great care of us. Um, whether that's chartered flights, um, eating out at nice meals, uh, I, I they take great care of us. I think there is. Um, I think there is a difference, though, between um, between my program and what you just heard um, from the Green Bay program. I think it's I think we don't we don't work we don't have to go out and fundraise as much for our for our money that we receive. Um, I just think we have boosters. We have we we've been in we've got recruited and started into a program that has been a huge blessing that. You know, you don't even see is coming into the program. You don't see all the all the little things that can make life a lot harder and make this um, this opportunity a lot harder that we have we have sort of just walked into, and it's really been a blessing for us. And Colleen, how about you? I think one of the things that hasn't really been touched on much is the facilities that we have in athletics. Uh, Loyal has been ranked in the top ten or so in the past few years through Princeton Review for our uh, athletic facilities. And for me, they're unbelievable. We have some really great turf fields for a small school. The stadium that we have is huge in comparison to the other schools that we play at. And I think that uh, some stu uh, students, they, they look at it and they see that they're not able to use our, our athletic gym and, and different things like that, but 
for us, it, it helps us succeed on and off the field. Uh, it, it's what it has made us a better program. We've had some really great teams out of our school. Our lacrosse team's done phenomenal. And I think it is really thanks to some of the facilities that we've been able to keep and to, to play at. It, it makes me proud to be a Loyola student athlete to see that. And just like everyone else said, too, we have very similar uh, experiences and and I'm very fortunate to be a student athlete. You know, uh, we talked about you know the time commitment of being a student athlete, you know, and balancing that time. Um, Houston, can you talk about how your department kind of helps you balance being a student with being an athlete? What are some of the support systems in place that help you succeed and 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 you know and and uh, thrive uh, under all the time commitment and pressures that you have? Yeah, coming coming in with a different perspective, um, I, I kind of looked at it as, oh wow, all I have to do is go to practice and go to class. This is awesome, you know. Um, in comparison to everything that I was dealing with in professional baseball, but the really cool thing about UNC is that, and, I, and I'm sure it's true at other universities, but from the very second you walk in the door, um, there's a lot of structure there. They do give you freedom to make mistakes on your own and to learn from those mistakes and to grow as as a person and as an athlete. Uh, but for example, all all freshmen have manda excuse me first years have mandatory um, uh, study hall every week. It varies by team, but it can range from six hours to to up to twelve hours with the track and field team, just to make sure um, that there are guided studies and tutors and and that there's help there, academic advisors for you to make sure you're staying on the right track. Of course, the NCAA has guidelines in place, um, you know, to limit practice and things of that nature. Uh, but but you're right. There are so many positive structures in place that help student athletes just roll right through um, and really take care of their business in an appropriate manner. Colleen, how about the support systems there at Loyola? I know it, Loyola. It's a it's a uh, prestigious academic institution. It's not easy. It's not easy. How how are they supporting you in and being successful as a student and balancing the athlete portion as well? Sure, we have some really great athletic academic advisors that have really kind of helped me personally and I know uh, some of my teammates and fellow student athletes to succeed and they really kind of set us up for success right off the bat uh, like Houston said we have the mandatory study hall hours in the beginning and you kind of work your way out of that and as you keep your grades up you can you can stay out of study hall but if you need that extra boost it's there but we also have uh, some really great professors who kind of understand the the uh, what comes with being a student athlete, the time commitments, and they kind of help you to succeed. They know that maybe you might not be doing as much of the preparation for your homework, but what you're getting out of being an athlete and being able to balance your time and manage everything is just huge. But uh, again, the academics uh, support staff that we have is just, it, it's what's helped me to succeed. It kind of helps me to understand how I need to balance my class schedule in order to become uh, to to do well in classes, but then also to make sure I'm on track to graduate and different things like that as well. You know, one of the headline grabbing comments from uh, a student athlete in the last couple of years was was made by a UConn basketball player back in 14, where he he in a, a press conference, I believe it was around the Final Four, said that he often went to bed hungry. I'm curious, Malcolm. We'll start with you here, being you know a men's basketball student athlete who just talked about some of the tangible benefits. What was your reaction when you heard that comment? Uh, it's a very it's a very strong comment, um, but I have to say there's 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 deception, there's exaggeration in that comment, but there is truth to the comment. Um, specifically, that student athletes go to bed hungry. I can't say I agree with that, but I can say I agree with student athletes not having, some student athletes not having sufficient funds to eat the high quality of food that they need to eat in order to perform at a high level. Um, for me, I'm an athlete that takes my diet, that takes my, my, my eating regimen very seriously. And a lot of times I can say that I don't feel comfortable spending a certain amount of money because I think it, it cuts into my pocket too much because there's not enough money um, that is given to us to buy a, a high quality of food. So you're distinguishing between necessity of food is available, you're not going to be hungry, and you know organic, high quality, uh, you know meals. Is that was that what you're saying? Right, right. I I, I have uh, that comment that he made really made me 
start to think and process it. And I've, I've started to, I think I believe that a athletes need the sufficient funds to perform at a high level. And that means sufficient funds to the point that we are able to buy the food that we need to buy. And in terms of whether that's organic, whether that's whatever you feel like you need, you should be able to purchase that food. Um, this isn't talking about shoes, clothes, and all the other extra stuff. This is talking about food, the stuff we need to go out there and represent the university and the community. And I feel like sufficient funds are the are the, are necessary. And I think that's one of the things that you know everybody in college athletics agrees upon that uh, you need to give athletes the fuel. And certainly in the last year, we've seen some big strides there in terms of. Uh, you know, additional nutritional supplements and additional nutrition spending for, for student athletes. Marin, uh, as a basketball player as well, what, what was your reaction to those comments when you heard them? Um, I think I had around the same perception of that and reaction as Malcolm did. Um, now, for our program alone, they do a great job of providing us with what we need. If a student athlete is trying to be financially independent and give themselves a balanced diet and a very strict diet and put the proper things in our bodies. I believe that a little bit more funding would be needed. I think that if you have support from home, if you have a second job, um, I don't think it is necessary. However, with the time commitment required in our program, with the dedication that is necessary to become the at the level that we want to play at, a, uh, a strict diet is required, A another Funding is required, um, but that's all. It, I think it de it really. I think it um, depends on the individual. I think it depends on the background circumstances. But I think that additional funding is needed. Like Malcolm said, if you want to go out and represent your university the best, and if you want to give the time commitment necessary to become the best student athlete that you need to be and represent your university, additional funding would definitely help. And Colleen Houston, any any comments from you on that? Any f reaction or, or feedback there? Sure, I think it's a it's a two way street between the athletes and the athletic department. Uh, for for us, we've been our soccer stadium is off campus, and so it's very difficult to get back in time for dinner to before the dining hall closes. So that's a conversation with our athletic department to ask that we set aside meals after the dining hall closes for our team to come and pick up or eat at the dining hall. So that was difficult to organize and it's still something that we're trying to work the kinks out of, but I think that having that open dialogue with our athletic department has really kind of helped us make strides. We've also tried to work on what type of healthy options can we have at our stadium so that when we finish practice we'll have food necessary right, right away. And um, that's kind of the one thing that, that we struggle with, but I know that having that communication with our athletic department has really kind of helped alleviate some of the misconceptions of, or misperceptions of what we have. All right, I got I got to hear from the minor league former minor league baseball player here. <laughs> Com compare her nutrition availability uh, now versus performing at peak yeah. level in, in in the minor leagues. Uh, so, uh, so there is no there is no comparison. You know, if, if you go from if you're talking big league food, okay, that's a different story. But you know, there there is no comparison. And I think here at, at UNC, um, it sounds like we're we're probably a little bit ahead of the curve, but. Um, I could be mistaken on this. I believe we have four full-time nutritionists here that serve all of our sports. Um, after every one of our workouts, we have you know basically a snack bar that allows us um, you know protein shakes and and Cliff bars, Gatorade bars, so forth and so on. And then during the regular school year, we have um, a training table where you know there's there's free sandwiches every day, and and we can pick three items. Um, football is a step up from that um, for obvious reasons. Um, they're, they're extremely well taken care of with prepared meals, but even non-revenue sport athletes here at UNC are treated very, very well. Of course, I was just you know, cooking all of my meals all the time, um, but I, I think all in all, we do a fantastic job here at UNC. Let's talk a little bit about recruiting. You know, uh, e each of you were recruited by other programs uh, than the ones that you decided to attend. You had some options. You were standout athletes. Uh, Malcolm, quickly summarize for us what helped you land on, on UVA. What, what were the most important factors in your decision when you were being recruited? Uh, what should administrators know about 
recruiting student athletes in terms of what mattered for you? Um, really what mattered for me the most was education. I come from a very educational um, education background type family. Um, my The emphasis on what school I picked was going to rely on education and then basketball. So looking at UVA, it was between UVA and Vanderbilt. They were both phenomenal um, institutions academically. Um, and then I looked at basketball, and I and I had to look at a, look for a coach that um, honestly I thought I, I didn't realize I was looking for it, but I was looking for a coach that resembled my temperament um, and had you know characteristics that I was that I you know tried to live my life by, and that was Coach Bennett here at the University of Virginia. Um, he's a man of God, and um, that really attracted me. But I wouldn't even say the religion and and you know the the coach is what I was really looking for the most. I, I would I would say it was academics. I think if an institution can can push their academics and and show the student athlete how this um, how their institution will transform and and you know write their ticket and prepare them for the real world after after their sport is done after school is over. Um, I think that's what's most important and that's what can grab. Um, you know, a high schooler or a high schooler's parents and really intrigue them. Marin, what mattered for you in recruiting most? Um, well, first and foremost, education. Um, I knew I wanted to go into education, and Green Bay has a very well-respected education program. Um, and then you look at, you start to talk to the alumni, you start to talk to the current team, and they have a 100% job placement rate. Um, the the community just just embraces just embraces us so much and so there's always job opportunities um, and then on a separate note with women's basketball it's really challenging playing on the road I think and so while doing visits going to games um, and even more so now when we go on the road it is very very tough to uh, play in an empty gym and um, we deal with that night in and night out and this is no disrespect to any other university they all have great followings but um, Green Bay is something special especially for women's basketball and they've really built a culture um, in high school we didn't win too much um, I was blessed with great teammates but not great records um, and so I wanted to go to a program where I had the chance to compete for a conference title every year and go to the NCAA tournament and um, I found that in Green Bay and the fan base I could talk about it all day the community sport and the fan base like aside from the aside from the Packers we are we are the um, the follow that that's who people live our Sunday games are sold out and it is it makes coming to play a game and playing here so special and you don't lose the excitement of it so aside from the education which is obviously the most important um, just playing in front of a pack house every night and being excited to play and really cherishing the fans and the boosters and the people who are just willing to do whatever they can to help you succeed and that comes in job placements after graduation that comes in a full house every single night and teams women's teams that come to play here don't know what to expect walking in because they're not expecting that many fans on a Tuesday Wednesday night game and it's really special so I think that coming here and watching a game just kinda sold me Colleen I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that education was important because you're going for your MBA in 1516 <laughs> and uh, you're working for KPMG thereafter so I want to tweak the question a little bit. Education was important for all your school choices. Was there something that separated Loyola? You know, was there something that 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 they did or they showed you that that made the difference for you? Sure. Um, our business school is phenomenal. I can't speak enough of it. And there was just so many opportunities that I was able to envision myself having by going to to the business school at Loyola. And I mean, it, it's it's proved me wrong even better than I could have imagined. It's given me so many ways outside of sports to succeed in terms of being in honors uh, programs and different special leadership programs through our business school. So I didn't see that necessarily in some of the other schools that I was being recruited to play for. While they were very good institutions, I think just the, the Jesuit background of being a Catholic school and the business school were really huge on top of the enticing athletic program that we had. Houston, were you just coming home? Were you just coming back to the Tar Heel State, man? Or, 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 is, or are there different schools, different factors? Hello? Can you hear me, Houston? 
Oh, we we'll, we'll we'll come back to Houston. Colleen, Marin, Malcolm, you all can still hear me, okay? Yes, sir. Good deal. All right, so let's keep rolling here. Um, you know, I, I can I can hear you. It's cutting in and out, so I, I apologize. I can oh, no I problem. hear some things and I don't hear others. Um, yeah, no no problem at all. Can in terms of recruitment, were you coming back? Was it really about coming back to North Carolina, or were, or were there other factors that really weighed in on your recruitment? Um, you know, it's it's interesting for as far as track is concerned. You know, I can speak to baseball and being recruited for baseball, but I, I think sticking with track here. Um, you know, I basically had to beg coach to let me on the team, and then he allowed me to try out, and he did so. So that's definitely a different dynamic than than what our other three panelists have have discussed there. Um, but for me, it was coming to the University of North Carolina was about this commitment to excellence in the classroom and and outside of the classroom. It was this commitment to tradition and innovation at the same time. And and as we all know, there's you know um, been a lot of issues in the news and, and in the media about the University of North Carolina and what we're doing to to you know, mitigate some of those issues, and I've been a huge part of that um, as student body president and a member of the board of trustees here at UNC. Um, and that's been an incredible opportunity for us to to learn and grow and to pave the way um, as to what college athletics should look like in the future. So for me, it was just this innovative spirit that that I got out of Carolina. Um, not to mention Michael Jordan and some of those other guys that have my play here. So he's, um, that's, well, that's always. He's, He's still helping recruiting like 30, 30 years later. I mean, it's not surprising, I guess, but that's it's, it's great. Well, right. I'll, I'll let Malcolm talk about that if he wants. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that in the basketball world. <laughs> One of the other, uh, you know, big developments in college athletics is paying full cost of attendance, you know, as it relates to additional benefits for student athletes. Um, I don't want to get into the the weeds of you know how much and 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 who should get it and who 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 shouldn't. Um, we'll start with Malcolm here. What's the general discussion in the locker room? I mean, are, are, is it is it on the radar of current players? Are you guys talking about it, or is it just business as usual? And you'll know when something changes. Um, it's for us specifically. It's it's business as usual. We'll know when something changes. Um. We know a lot of talk about it isn't really going to change much. We sort of wait for the new um, regulations and, and things to change. Colleen, how about you as a uh, as a non-revenue sport? Is it is it even on the radar? It hasn't really been brought up much. I've talked to my athletic director about it a little bit, and I think uh, it, it could be beneficial. But right now, we're just kind of show up and play and, and do our job, and if something happens, it happens. And, and Marin, I think you you all are beginning to receive full cost of attendance this year. Is that correct? Um, well, based on the allotment of finances from our financial department, we are not getting full cost, but we are being um, compensated. Um, and again, that just reflects on our athletic department being the hardest working athletic department in the country, in my opinion, and they're going out and they're getting those funds for us because we work hard for the funding we get, and they're going out and they're getting it for us. And um, I think that we talked about this a little bit, but we're just uh, we're very grateful for what we get. But women's basketball, men's basketball are the only two re um, receiving that at our university. So we're very grateful for it, and we know that they, the athletic department and the people in charge are working hard for us. But um, yeah, that goes into effect with us for fall. Extremely, extremely humbled by it and grateful, and it uh, it is going to help. From I mean, what. We talked about before, there is that sufficient funding now to provide us for that rigorous diet that we want and to provide for us to not have that second job so we can continue to fully represent our university by developing ourselves as much as we can on the court and pouring like our life into developing ourselves as student athletes. And um, So we're very thankful for it, and that goes to place in fall. Um, I do believe that we are one of two or three within our conference that passed it this year. Um, all funding is different, obviously, per school, but we are just very thankful for the little amount that we, whatever amount we do get, um, just very thankful for it. You know, student athletes get often get the chance to take part in leadership initiatives and activities during their playing career. You know, from Houston, you mentioned student government uh, to you know visiting children's hospitals. Uh, because of the commitment that you all put into your universities, I want to give each of you the opportunity. To talk about some of your leadership activities, you know, recently in, in your early days of, of playing, that you've had the opportunity to take part in, uh, in, in being a student athlete. So, how are you giving back to your community? What are some of the positive uh, impacts that you've had, uh, Colleen? We'll start with you there. Sure. Um, 
I guess one of the really cool things that I got a chance to be a part of, and it was kind of through the early beginnings of my uh, career at Loyola as a soccer player, was being a member of the Green and Gray Society at school. It's a prestigious society within Loyola that is, I'm, I was one of 14 seniors to advise our president of the university and kind of be his right-hand man to some of the things that were going on within the student body that he might not be aware of or that uh, if there was issues that came up or different things that we would kind of be his voice within the community. So um, it was really cool and I don't think that I would have had that opportunity had I not been a student athlete and kind of push myself outside of just athletics to leadership opportunities uh, both in and out of the community, leadership through SAC, leadership through uh, just really anything business school. So it, for me, that was a really impactful and uh, meaningful experience that I, I could talk forever about. Houston, how about you? Yeah, so there's there's been so many opportunities from my you know, from my first year I got involved in the Student Athlete Advisory Council and then ended up serving on the Student Advisory Council to the Chancellor and ultimately decided to run for student body president about the time of the Weinstein Report. Um, was fortunate enough to win that election and have, you know, served for the past few months on the Board of Trustees alongside uh, Phil Clay, who was the first African American Chancellor at MIT, with, with Peter Grauer, who is, you know, the CEO of Bloomberg. Um, you know, taking all of these amazing individuals and their ideas and, and being able to absorb parts of them and, and build them into who I am as an individual um, and then take those things back out into the community as a student athlete, those ideas, it's, it's incredibly impactful for the community. Um, just last week we got to go to uh, the Burns Center here at UNC uh, and, and just visit with kids and, and doctors and nurses and understand what their daily lives are like. and trying to take this, you know, full circle and understand that being a student athlete isn't just about being a student athlete, it's about, you know, building individuals to become better people and better citizens. And, and I think, you know, UNC does an amazing job of that and there's been so many doors open, uh, you know, to me here at the university to allow me to do that and I'm incredibly grateful for it. Malcolm, you talked about the desire to, to work on a nonprofit, you know, to, to provide food and water. That, that, you know, jumped out at me. Talk about you know, uh, some of your experiences over the last few years in your playing career and then maybe how those might translate into the future for you? Well, you know, I, I had the opportunity to partic participate in a um, campaign called Hosea Feed the Hungry where we went out and we were able to, you know, serve food to those less fortunate. Um, but I, I, that while that was very impactful, I also had, you know, very impactful um, opportunities like I've been able to serve on a couple panels talking to um, elementary school kids and um, you know that really is that really strikes me as so important because in that at that stage of my life I wish I would I wish I was involved in uh, being spoken to by older student athletes in college that could advise me on you know what to focus on um, what things in life they thought that were very important um, going forward and, um, you know, it was, it, it really was significant for me to do that. Um, but as far as Hosea Feed the Hungry, going forward, I, I, um, I really hope to, you know, use that opportunity and use everything that I'm, I'm acquiring from this opportunity in college to be a student athlete to go forward and transform people's lives and, um, you know, use the resources I have to change people's lives. Marin, how about you? Yeah, um, I know I've spoke the entire time on the community support, and that's the biggest thing is that our athletic department knows that we go with the boosting and the fundraising we get from the community, so the least we can do is give back. The least we can do is pour ourselves back into the community because we understand that without them, we don't go. Um, so that, that we work hand-in-hand hand with countless organizations and fundraising events and reading to kids in the schools and going in and speaking to kids in the schools. Um, we do as much as we can because we're just so very grateful for the support that we have and in particular our women's basketball team. Um, we also adopted a Team Impact uh, little girl and Team Impact is uh, an organization that places children with um, very severe health issues 
with sports. So we had a team um, national letter of intent signing day for her, and she's been a part of our team since uh, last um, I want to say last December, so that's been a really cool addition to our team, and she, she's a little bright, just sun ray that <laughs> really, really loves ha being a part of our team. She's got, she's got a locker in our locker room, and she really enjoys it, but in the end, we just try to give back as much as we can because, again, the community makes us go, and whatever we can do to give back, we're willing to, and we're just so very appreciative of them, and it's a really great thing we've got going up here, and the community is solely the reason why we have it. Oh, what a what a great story! You know, I, we could we could go on. Uh, I have other questions, but I know we have a time limit. We could go on for a long time. Uh, I gotta say personally, this is this is one of the uh, coolest hangouts that that I've done. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. You know, uh, my immediate takeaways from our conversation in the moment are number one that all of you have incredibly bright futures, uh, and then the second thing is that that there's a genuine appreciation for the fact that. Uh, athletics has has changed the trajectory of your life and what you what you're going to be able to accomplish and and how it's prepared you to accomplish those things. So I just want to say thank you again to all of you for taking part of this. I want to thank our audience for joining us uh, as well today and uh, uh, look forward to to keeping up with each of you as you continue on your journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Absolutely. Thank you guys. Have a great afternoon. Take care. You too, Kevin.